reach the audience. Sucked dry. The Hanford Market parking lot was almost completely deserted when Randy pulled his 1972 Chevy Love with the flame paint job into his accustomed space. He looked out through his tinted windows and ran a hand through his short, frizzy hair. The small family-owned market had been in a decline ever since the basket market chain moved into town and set up shop. Customers had sworn their allegiance to the small business at first, proclaiming no corporate behemoth could dethrone their familiar and wholesome establishment in their hearts. But, in time, almost all of them had been swayed by the lower prices and larger selection. The vehicle of his career had run out of gas, and it was only a matter of time before it lost all inertia and he would have to abandon it. He retrieved his name tag from the cup holder in his center console, and stared at it for a few moments, reading the words aloud but softly. Randy Cortman, assistant manager. It took him years to earn the position. He had started as a 16-year-old bag boy, and he would have been a shoe in for general manager if he weren't essentially working in a grave waiting to be filled. In a moment of weakness, Randy had gone and applied for a job at the chain, but during the interview, he was informed that only entry-level jobs were being offered, and if he were interested in a managerial opportunity, he'd have to move through the ranks with no less than a year's time spent in each successive position. Another year as a bag boy, then as a stock clerk, then as a cashier, then as a team lead. And to Randy, it was climbing down the mountain he was almost at the top of to dig a hole at the foot of another to sit in for a full 12 months. He shook his head, trying to cast off all the thoughts of the future, and pinned his name tag to his company-issued polo shirt. The automatic doors parted before him with a slight chuffing sound, and as he stepped into the store, he was greeted by the familiar scents of the produce department, mixed with the aroma of fresh bread being made in the bakery. The overhead speakers played a soft, inoffensive mix of pop songs from the 70s and 80s, reimagined for use in elevators and devoid of lyrics. Currently. The strains of Elton John's Philadelphia Freedom, as played by a sedated string quartet and saxophonist, was the only thing breaking the silence in the building. All five checkout lanes were empty, save for one. Randy looked over and saw Helen, a middle-aged woman with chestnut hair that was slowly giving way to gray, as she stood behind the register at lane two, casually flipping through an issue of the Midnight Star. Hi, Ellen, Randy called out. The woman lifted her blue eyes from the newsprint, and her lips spread in a wide smile that accentuated the almost imperceptible age lines around her eyes and at the corners of her mouth. Hi, Randy, she called in a cheery voice. Are you closing tonight? At this, Randy shrugged his shoulders and held up a hand in an exaggerated gesture and said, If no one else decides they'd like to, I guess I'm stuck with it. At this, Helen chuckled a bit, but Randy continued. Has it been this slow all day? Pretty much, yeah, Helen said with a nod. And then her face brightened as if she remembered something very important. After I got in around 8, all the firefighters from the station up the street stopped in and they were driving the fire truck. Sounds like you must have been in heaven, Randy shot back a sly grin. A bunch of strapping men running around the store in suspenders, she asked rhetorically. Yeah, you could say I had a pretty good morning. Randy shook his head with a laugh. All right, I gotta go get clocked in, but I'll come back around before you leave for the day. Okay, hon, she said before returning her attention to the rag from the newsstand. The flimsy doors that led to the stockroom swung open as Randy shoulders his way through them. He located his time card in the rack on the back wall that now held less than half of what it had in the past year and slid the stiff cardstock into the mechanical time clock. The machine stamped the card with a loud metal ka-chunk, and Randy slid it back into the rack. Making his way back to the manager's office, he could hear the shuffling of papers, and when he stuck his head in, it was exactly as he'd pictured it. Ken, the only other assistant manager, was leafing through order forms and other various papers on what was at one time a desk that now resembled the aftermath of a hurricane hitting an office supply store. Ken's stubby fingers continued to paw through the clutter as beads of sweat glistened on the man's balding head. 
After a few moments, Randy cleared his throat in an effort to attract the pudgy man's attention, but to no avail. Hey, Ken, Randy said, his body filling the threshold of the door. The man's thick arms jerked as if they were hit with an electrical shock, nearly tossing the handfuls of paper skyward. Jesus, Randy, you scared the shit out of me, Ken said, his eyes wide and bulging. Give a guy a heart attack, why don't you? Sorry, Ken, I thought you heard me come in. Anyway, what's up? You got anything to report? Randy asked, picking up a clipboard full of order forms. Ken relaxed into his chair and extended both arms toward the desk. Oh, you know, just the usual. I've been here since 4 a.m. to receive the last delivery, and I guess that all went okay. He shuffled through the clutter on the desk for a moment and then handed Randy a single sheet of pink paper. The only thing you'll have to deal with is the shipment of Zima we have coming in at 12.30. So, you have about half an hour before that shows up? All right, I can handle that, Randy said, looking over the sheet. Why don't you get out of here, then? I can handle it from here. Ken stood up out of the office chair with a wheeze and pushed his thick glasses back up onto the bridge of his nose. You don't have to tell me twice. Give me a call if you need anything. You got it. Have a good night, Ken, Randy said as he stepped out of the doorframe. You too, Ken called over his shoulder as he made his way to the time clock and then disappeared through the double doors. Back in the office, Randy picked up the shift checklist affixed to the clipboard and slid a pen behind his right ear. He knew he had enough time to get at least a few displays checked off before the order of Zima came in, so he made his way back out to the floor and began going through the row of chillers that held the frozen desserts. At the end of the first row, everything seemed in order and Randy was about to move to the next when the music overhead was interrupted by a soft three-tone chime. That sound meant that someone was depressing the doorbell in the loading bay at the back of the store. Randy looked at his watch and saw the time was only 12.18, which meant that, for the first time since he had started as assistant manager, an order had arrived early instead of late. At the rear exit, Randy peered through the peephole in the door and saw a man dressed in a black shirt and shorts swinging open the rear doors of a trailer. Seeing this, he grabbed for the control of the sliding door and pressed the green button on the device. After a few moments, the electric motor begrudgingly sprung to life and began lifting the steel door like his garage door at home. The figure of the delivery man was slowly revealed as the barrier ascended noisily along its track finally revealing the man in full as he walked up the ramp to unfasten the hand truck, finally revealing the man in full as he walked up the ramp to unfasten the hand truck from one of the trailer's interior walls. How you doing? The man called out, not turning his attention away from his task. Not too bad, Randy returned, hoping the small talk would end there. The man worked in silence, much to Randy's delight, stacking cases of the malt beverage onto the dolly and then slowly bringing them down the ramp. As he passed by Randy, he handed him an invoice that he took and studied. It showed an order of 15 cases, each shrink-wrapped and containing 16 bottles. Usually an order like that would have taken 10 or 15 minutes to unload, but the way this guy handled the product, it would be work of only two or three. In no time at all, the third and final trip down the ramp was being made, but at about the halfway point, the man faltered, jostling the dolly and sent the topmost case careening toward the ground. The impact sounded with a large crash as clear, citrus-scented liquid began leaking through the holes in the shrink wrap. Oh, shit, the delivery man explained after hearing the sound of the shattered glass, followed by a soft gurgling noise. I'm sorry about that, man. Don't sweat it, Randy said, holding up a hand. It didn't even break the plastic wrap. I'll just chuck it into the dumpster. Randy bent down to examine the package and stood up again, saying, None of the glass even got out, so I won't even need a broom. Let me take care of it. It was my fault, the man said, dropping off the final load. I even carry a couple extra in the truck in case this happens, so I can replace it right now. Quickly, the man rolled the dolly back up the ramp, secured it, and had another case in hand before Randy could even offer assistance. He set the fresh case on the shortest of the three stacks, then deftly swept up the broken case and tossed it into the nearby dumpster. The sound was deafening as the bottles came into contact with the metal bottom and both men hunched their shoulders at the racket. Whoa, sorry about that. I didn't know it was empty, the delivery man said with a grimace. They must have just emptied it, Randy said, peering over the lip of the bin. It happens. All right, man, I'll catch you next time, the man said, snugging the doors of the trailer closed. 
Before Randy knew it, the diesel engine fired up and the truck was slowly leaving the rear loading bay. With his thumb now on the red button of the control, the metal door started rolling back down into place. Once it was firmly shut, he took back up his clipboard and continued his display check out on the floor. It was just going to be another slow day at work. 2. The shattered bottles of Zima disgorged their contents into shimmering puddles at the bottom of the dumpster. The soft hissing of the bubbles whispered to no one as the carbonation escaped the liquid into the fetid air of the trash container. Before long, the sweet aroma of the sugary liquor attracted dozens of black, buzzing flies that hopped from place to place, sopping up the beverage through their hideous proboscises. It wasn't long before the carrion insects began flying in erratic, alcohol-infused spirals. The intoxicated bugs bounced off the walls of the dumpster, the buzzing of their wings interrupted occasionally by the soft plink-plink sound as their bodies impacted the metal barriers. A mosquito, one of the last remnants of the summer surge, happened upon the scene and touched down on the shimmering plastic wrap. Though the liquid that spread out beneath it seemed to be more like water than blood, the tiny creature seemed drawn to it for reasons unknown to even her. The delicate animal flew to the edge of the pool and tentatively dipped the tip of her snout into it and took a tiny sip. Though it was not blood, it passed the taste test and so the mosquito drank deeply. After its thirst had been slaked, the mosquito tried employing its wings in flight, but it found the task impossible. Its limited senses had been thrown for a loop, and the scene before its compound eyes began to spin and tilt. Soon, her legs faltered and she was lying prone. The dimensions of the world around her seemed to distort, and before she gave way fully into unconsciousness, she felt her body grow heavy, heavier than she had ever felt it before. 3. At 2.30, Randy had run through his displays and refilled all the holes where products had been removed by customers. With little else to do, he decided he'd toss the clipboard under the desk and back and maybe spend a little time chatting up Helen at the front. As he made his way up aisle 12 where the store kept their fruit juices, sports drinks, and powdered drink mixes, Randy's eyes immediately fell upon a large red pool of fruit punch. The store was virtually empty, so there was little to no danger of someone slipping in the mess, but it irritated Randy to see it sitting there. At around 1 o'clock, he had heard a cleanup call over the intercom and had just assumed that it had been taken care of, but there it was, still sitting there over an hour later, and that made his blood heat up a little bit more. Randy jogged to the janitorial closet, filled a yellow mop bucket with warm water, added a cap of the cleansing solution, grabbed a wet floor sign, and quickly headed back to the spill. After setting up the sign, he wrung out the mop head and slapped it on the floor with a soggy splat. The water in the bucket was soon a bright pink as Randy made pass after pass over the stain. The spill had been left alone for so long that the juice had become viscous and sticky, and the extra effort needed to clean it up acted upon Randy's attitude like heat to a pressure hooker. He had scrubbed the floor the best he could and even changed the water in the bucket two times before he gave up and accepted that the stain had completely set in. It was no longer sticky, but the substantial ghost of the spill still promised to haunt the store for years to come. After he had put away the cleaning supplies, he marched up to the front of the store and took a look around. Helen still stood at the register reading a magazine, now having switched to a copy of OK, and at the far end he could see Cliff in the bakery tidying up and rearranging the pre-made birthday cakes. He hadn't checked the schedule to see who was working as bagger and cleanup, but he wanted to vent his frustration more than actually catch the culprit, so he walked up to Helen's counter, let out a dramatic sigh, and leaned over her station. Oh my, Helen said, placing her palm against her chest to accentuate the melodrama. You look like you got something eating you. Ugh, Randy said, rolling his eyes. Didn't you call for a cleanup on aisle 12? I sure did. Didn't Marcus take care of that? She asked. No. I was walking to the back and there it was. Someone had broken open one of the 32-ounce fruit punch bottles and it was everywhere. And to top it off, it stained the floor but good. Well, that's not like Marcus at all, Helen said, her face losing its exaggerated look of scandal. No, it's not, Randy said, knitting his eyebrows together. Did you see him come in today? Helen nodded at this. Yeah, I saw him come in about 45 minutes after you showed up. I remember Cliff called him over for something, and I haven't seen him since. 
All right, I'll see if I can find him. You keep up the good work up here, okay? Randy said with a wink. Helen's cheeks flushed slightly, and Randy began walking toward the bakery, casting his eyes down every passing aisle. Cliff was a tall man in his early forties, with hair neatly combed under the mandatory hairnet. He wore a mustache that reminded everyone of the one their dads wore when they were kids, and his brown eyes somewhat supplemented the fatherly aspect of his visage. His back was turned to the store as he ran a damp rag over his workspace, making the stainless steel surface shine. Quietly, Randy stepped up to the service counter and struck the silver service bell with his finger and waited patiently for Cliff to turn around. Be right with you, Cliff said in a cheery voice, his back still turned to the counter. Let me just get this finished up here. Take your time, Randy answered in falsetto tones. At this, Cliff froze and spun around with a look of surprise that relaxed once he saw the speaker. You rascal, Cliff said, tossing the rag into a bucket. I thought we had a customer here. Sorry to disappoint, Randy said, shrugging. Hey, have you seen Marcus anywhere? Cliff scratched his chin and thought for a moment. Yeah, about half an hour ago, I had him take my trash bin out back to dump it because it was full and I didn't want to leave the counter. Come to think of it, he hasn't come back with it yet. I'll run to the back and see if I can find him, Randy said, turning to leave, then froze. Did he look sick to you or anything? He's never just disappeared like that before. Well, maybe he went and got a job at Basket Market, Cliff offered. Randy sniffed at this. If he did, I'll wring his neck. Cliff chuckled a little at this, and Randy gave him a wave and took his leave of the man. His temper had cooled off a bit, but as he walked through the cereal aisle, he could feel a tinge of anger returning. The back room was completely devoid of life, so the next place to look was out in the loading bay by the dumpster. Pushing open the rear exit, he looked around for any signs of life. It was still warm and bright outside, and Randy held a flat hand over his eyes to shield them from the late summer sun. To his surprise, he found the bakery trash bin sitting near the dumpster still full. He ducked inside for a moment to grab the old wooden doorstop the smokers used to keep the door propped open on their brakes and slid it into the jam. Slowly, he made his way down the ramp and was about to step around the safety railing when a sound made him turn his head. His eyes caught the briefest glimpse of something dark disappearing through the doorway, followed by a strange skittering. The thing was hard to make out because it happened so fast, and Randy wasn't even sure he'd seen anything solid at all. Marcus? Randy called half-heartedly, but there was no answer. What the fuck is going on here, he said under his breath. He thought, perhaps, that a raccoon had been lying in wait and ran inside when it seen the coast was clear. That had happened before during the warmer months when the furry little creatures sought to get out of the hot, humid air. This was all he needed. First the spill, then his missing employee, and now he was going to have to hunt for a loose raccoon. First things first, though. He needed to empty that can and get it back to the bakery. He grabbed one of the handles with one hand and slid the other under the bottom of the gray plastic container. With a grunt, he lifted the whole mess and poured the garbage into the dumpster. He shook the can a few times to dislodge any stragglers stuck at the bottom when he cast a casual glance into the dumpster itself. The garbage is spread out pretty evenly, but something about the way it bunched together and sat higher in certain areas sent a slight chill up Randy's spine. He could vaguely trace a familiar outline and feared that it was more than mere coincidence. With a shaky hand, he pulled the pen from behind his ear and began prodding the pile of clutter. As a balled-up paper towel was dislodged and rolled away from the pile, Randy caught a glimpse of something startling beneath it. What he saw was a sliver of green polyester material, strikingly similar to the color of shirt that was issued to the lower-level employees. His blood felt like ice water flowing through his veins, and despite his deeper judgment, he continued to probe the garbage. All at once there was a shifting, and Randy pulled his arm out of the dumpster with a blur of motion. He stood, horror-struck, eyes bulging from their sockets, a scream held frozen in his throat, refusing to vacate his windpipe. What the sliding garbage revealed was the face of his missing employee, but at the same time, it wasn't. It had his hair and features, but the skin was pulled taut over the bones of his skull, and the mouth was wide open in a silent scream, the lips pulled back displaying two rows of off-white teeth. Randy stumbled backwards, away from the hideous corpse, and scrambled back up the ramp into the building. 
He kicked the doorstop aside and slammed the door shut, panting heavily. What could have done that? It looked as though every drop of blood had been sucked from Marcus's body and then just carelessly tossed into the dumpster. Then Randy remembered the thing he thought he saw for a brief instant in the doorway. His heart began to pound in his chest like a jackhammer. Could there be a madman in the store? Would the perpetrator have run through and exited the front doors, fearing being caught? Or, and this thought chilled him even further, could the killer be lurking around him now, waiting to pounce? The stockroom looked undisturbed, but that didn't mean anything. With the coast clear, Randy took off running for the manager's office and slammed the door behind him once he was inside. He quickly seized the phone on the desk, knocking a pile of papers to the floor in the process. As he entered the first digit in 911, there was a loud crash muffled only slightly by the closed door. Randy froze as a cold sweat broke out over his forehead. After a moment of silence, a strange intermittent buzzing filled his ears that reminded him of a small two-stroke engine suffering mechanical problems. His hands shook violently in fear as he tried to dial the remaining digits when he realized that though he was depressing the buttons, their familiar tones were absent in the earpiece. Outside the door, the sporadic buzzing sounds continued and Randy's breath caught in his throat. He began rifling through the desk drawers in search of anything he could use as a weapon. In one drawer, he found a bronze letter opener shaped like a samurai sword. It was dull as a butter knife, but it was all he had to work with, so he quickly snatched it up. Pressing his back against the office door, he twisted the knob and slowly crept into the stockroom. The hydraulic mechanism of the door pulled it shut again as soon as he was clear, and it closed with a low boom under the mild force. The sound caused the buzzing to stop, and the room was swallowed up by silence. Randy took a few steps forward, brandishing his makeshift weapon. His legs felt like rubber, and the hand holding the letter opener shook insurmountably. Pallets of paper goods, cereal, and other non-perishables waiting for the overnight crew to unpack filled the space and blocked most of Randy's view of the room. The skittering sound that had attracted his attention earlier started again, moving away from him before he heard the swinging double doors being pushed open and then swing shut. 4. Emerging from behind his cover, Randy surveyed the scene before him. One of the stacked cases of Zima had been pushed over, but as he studied the area, he was surprised at how little of the beverage was left standing on the floor. He knelt down and peered through the translucent plastic wrap and saw that most of the bottles had been broken open and contained only a few drops of the liquid, which confused him deeply. By all rights, there should have been gallons of the stuff spread out over the concrete floor, seeping into every available crevice and being absorbed by the paper products and cardboard packaging. What Randy saw was barely enough to warrant half a bucket of mop water. Something was wrong with this whole situation, but Randy knew he didn't have enough pieces to put it all together yet. Rising again to his full height, he noticed that leading from the capsized cases of liquor to the double doors was a strange collection of wet spots that conformed to a regular pattern that gave way just before the threshold. These markings made him feel like he had a gut full of marbles because they look similar to footprints, but the shape and number of the prints seemed to argue the opposite. Quickly, he moved to the doors and looked out at the store through one of the scuffed plastic windows. There were no signs that anything was amiss, and if it weren't for Marcus's fluid-drained body still lying in the dumpster, Randy could have sworn he was imagining things. Still gripping the letter opener in one hand, he slowly pushed one of the doors open and slipped out of the stockroom into the store proper and listened intently for anything out of the ordinary. A subdued version of Barry Manilow's Copacabana played over the scratchy speakers above his head as he cast his gaze this way and that. There was nothing. Randy charged up the closest aisle, flying past the shelves stocked with colorful cereal boxes, moving as fast as his legs would carry him. He moved like a bullet through the barrel of a gun but halted when he reached the front of the store. Breathing heavily, he continued to search for anything unusual, but still could find nothing amiss. Helen, whose attention had been attracted by Randy's curious searching, stepped from behind her register with a pinched look of concern on her pretty face. What's wrong, Randy? she asked, and then caught sight of his tightly balled fingers around the letter opener. Is everything okay? Did something happen in the back? Randy's eyes met hers, his breath still coming in heavy drafts. Have you seen anything weird up here? He asked, ignoring her questions. Not that I can recall, she said in calming tones. What exactly do you mean by weird? 
I found Marcus out back, he said, then hesitated. Something happened to him. I tried to call the police, but the phone is dead. I heard a crash in the back, and then someone or something ran into the stockroom, and, but before he could finish explaining, he was cut off by a blood-curdling scream that came from the bakery. Cliff! Randy yelled before he took off running in his direction. As Randy approached the bakery, he heard another scream of terror from the kitchen. He quickly ran around the counter and shouldered his way through the swinging kitchen door, then froze. What he saw defied rational explanation. At the far side of the room, he saw Cliff backed into a corner, brandishing an enormous cookie sheet, taking savage swings at something obscured by a large prep table in the middle of the room. Randy's ears were filled with the familiar buzzing he had heard in the stockroom, occasionally supplemented by Cliff's frightened ululations. Randy stepped around the prep table and his mouth fell open like a castle drawbridge. There, before his very eyes, was a monstrous mosquito, the size of a Rottweiler. Its chitinous body gleamed horribly under the fluorescent lights as its rugose wings broke into and out of torrents of furious flapping. It lunged at Cliff over and over again, looking to bury its titanic proboscis into the man's flesh. The creature's compound eyes were as large as baseballs, their thousands of facets reflecting the man's frightened image in startling clarity. Randy! Cliff shouted when he noticed he was no longer alone. What the fuck is this thing? Help me! Hold on! Randy yelled back. Just then, the kitchen door swung open and Helen appeared in the threshold. What is going on in here? She asked, walking over to where Randy stood. When she caught sight of the mosquito that had Cliff cornered, she screamed to clutch Randy's upper arm, her nails digging into his bicep. All the commotion quickly attracted the insect's attention. Its hideous alien head swiveled toward the pair, locking in their direction. Its body followed suit, and it was soon skittering toward them, its antenna flailing excitedly at the prospect of a hot meal. Randy shoved Helen firmly, but not angrily, toward the door and shouted, Get out of here! She stumbled hesitantly away before breaking into a full run, disappearing through the doorway. Seizing the leg of a prep table, Randy pulled with all of his might to place an obstacle between himself and the advancing behemoth, but his arms were nearly pulled from their sockets as the metal table was bolted to the concrete floor. Thinking quickly, he grabbed a large mixing bowl and thrust it in front of himself just as the creature lunged. The hypodermic mouthpiece cut through the air and ricocheted around the inside of the concave shield, each impact accompanied by a harsh metallic report. The sudden denial of what seemed like an easy meal sent the thing into a fury. Its wings buzzed almost constantly, and it thrust its proboscis, as thick as a bamboo shoot, toward Randy with a vigor born of unbridled rage. He deftly deflected each attack, but he knew he couldn't keep up his defense forever. The entirety of his attention was focused on the mosquito, so Randy did not see Cliff snatch up a heavy wooden rolling pin and hoist it above his head. With a savage yell, Cliff brought down the solid baking implement down upon the humped thorax between the wings of the giant mosquito with a great thwack. Aside from the grotesque sound of the impact, it had no effect on the abomination other than attracting its full, undivided attention. He let out a shriek of terror and lifted the pin for another strike when the beast quickly turned and sunk its feeding tube deep into his thigh. A scream of pain erupted from Cliff's throat as he brought the pin down upon the thing's back once again, but it was as ineffective as the first. Randy watched in horror as bright red arterial blood began to flow through the proboscis and the creature's hideous abdomen started to swell. The color quickly drained from Cliff's face, and his motions became sloppy and took on the airs of a man affected by drink. Run, Cliff said in a half-whisper, half-shout. I'm done for. Run, he said again, still raining weak blows upon the mosquito. As Randy took off running for the door, he cast one last glance back over his shoulder. He saw Cliff's eyes roll back into his head as the rolling pin clattered to the floor, slipping from the man's weakened grip. The kitchen door was almost ripped from its hinges as Randy barreled through it and away from the monster. He ran around the counter and nearly collided with Helen, who was standing in front of the chilled display case, both hands clutched to her chest, her wide-eyed gaze welded to the swinging kitchen door. Let's go, Randy shouted, grabbing one of her hands and pulling her with him as he ran. Where is Cliff? she cried hysterically. He didn't make it. Now let's move, he shouted, turning back to look at her. The two were panicking as Randy pulled her through the store, his mind racing. On their right, Randy saw the customer restrooms and he quickly led Helen into the men's room and pressed all his weight against the door from the inside, fighting the automatic door closer. 
The deadbolt was operated by a key from both sides so that no customers could lock themselves in, and Randy frantically rifled through his pockets for his manager's key ring. With fumbling hands, he slipped the key into the lock and slid the bolt home with a satisfying clunk. What do we do now? Helen asked through violent sobs. All Randy could do was look at her, because in his haste, instead of running to the sliding doors at the front of the store to escape, he had foolishly locked him in the store with the bloodthirsty killer mosquito. 5. Randy pressed his ear against the bathroom door and listened intently. Try as he might, he couldn't hear a thing, not even the piped-in Muzak from the PA. He turned to speak to Helen, but stopped when he thought he heard a muffled voice coming from inside the store. The blood in his veins froze as he realized there was someone, a customer perhaps, wandering around in the store calling out for assistance. He turned to Helen with a look on his face that asked, What should we do? Her lips parted, but she shut them again quickly and gave only a few truncated head shakes. We have to do something, he said in a whisper. There is someone out there with that thing running loose. Helen crossed her arms more tightly around herself and gave Randy a slow nod, at which point he took hold of the key still protruding from the deadbolt. The lock turned, terminating in a soft click, and Randy slowly pulled the door open a crack. The opening widened until it was big enough for his head to fit through, but he did not extend it past the threshold. Hello? came the elevated voice of a woman somewhere in the store. Is anyone working here? As Randy peered out of the store, he saw a woman emerge from aisle five, cock her hips to one side and rest her hands upon them in bald fists. She looked to be in her mid-thirties with dark hair and was dressed in a white shirt, dark slacks, and had an apron tied around her waist. Even from his vantage point, he could read the words Mi Jalisco embroidered in blue thread on the woman's shirt. Mi Jalisco was a little Mexican restaurant across the street from the market, and its employees were always coming in to pick up something that they had run out of in the kitchen. Hey! Randy called out in a hoarse whisper. The woman looked around for a moment before spotting Randy's head tucked away behind the men's room door. What is going on here? she asked, taking a few steps toward the door. Is everyone playing hide and seek? No, listen, we have a problem here. You need to get... But he stopped talking and his neck stiffened as a familiar sound filled his ears. What is that noise? The woman asked with a pinched look on her face. Run! Randy shouted. Run and call the police! The buzzing grew louder, drowning out his final plea. Helplessly, he watched as the mosquito slipped out of an aisle behind the woman and made a beeline right for her. The waitress turned and began to scream, but it was harshly cut off and replaced with a wet gurgling sound as the mosquito plunged its proboscis upward into the woman's body. Helen picked up the scream the waitress had begun, for though she could not see what was going on, the woman's frightful outburst cut short, followed by the sickening sound of suction told her exactly what had happened. Randy shoved the door closed again and slammed the deadbolt into place. He pounded on the door in frustration and fear before letting his arms fall limply to his sides. Turning to Helen, he saw that tears mixed with makeup were rolling down her face in rivulets of agony. He stepped forward, keeping his eyes low, and shook his head slowly from side to side. Helen burst into hysterics and came at Randy with both arms extended, wrapping them around him in a tight embrace. She held him, sobbing uncontrollably, pressing his head into her ample cleavage. Randy returned the embrace, filling his nostrils with her delicate perfume. A pang of guilt shot through him as he felt something stirring within himself for her. He wanted to pull away from shame, but... He held her and comforted her until her crying had subsided. Something stiffened on Helen's leg and she loosened her grip on Randy but did not wholly let go. The two looked into each other's eyes, glassy orbs holding terror within them, but also something more. Moving almost in unison, the two leaned toward one another and were instantly locked in a kiss, fueled by passion and fear. After a few moments, Helen pulled away and looked into Randy's eyes once more. What? What are we going to do? She asked, her voice faltering after the first word. I don't know, Randy said softly. He gave her another squeeze, and she returned it before separating. Helen wiped at her face with both hands, trying to remove the running makeup and tears. Randy pulled a few paper towels from the dispenser and handed them to her, which she took and continued to clean herself up. What is that thing out there? Helen asked, her voice muffled through the paper towels. Randy sighed. Hell if I know. 
It looks like a giant mosquito, but I've never heard of them getting this big. The only thing I know is that it has killed three people, and we have to do something to stop it. But what if we go out there and it just flies by and scoops us up? Helen asked, a quaver returning to her voice. I don't think it can fly, Randy said. The buzzing sound is that thing flapping its wings, and I think it's too heavy to lift off the ground. Otherwise, we'd have seen it fly by now. Well, we can't just wait in here while it sucks up every customer that walks through the door, Helen said, looking into the mirror. I wish I had a stiff drink, she added. That might be it, Randy said, pointing at Helen's reflection. What might be it, she asked. A stiff drink, he exclaimed. That thing knocked over and broke a bunch of cases from the Zima shipment this afternoon and drank up every last drop. If it still has a taste for it, I may be able to mix something in with it that would kill it. You're going back out there? Helen asked, turning to face him. It's either that or we wait here until someone realizes what's going on, and that could mean more lives lost. Helen's eyes welled up with tears, but she didn't say another word. If I don't come back for you, you wait here until someone else does, okay? Randy asked, putting his hands on her shoulders. Helen nodded, and tears fell from her eyes onto the tile floor. What are you going to do? she asked. Don't you worry. I've got a plan, he lied. Randy walked over to the door and took the key in his hand. He pressed his ear to the bathroom door and listened for the buzzing. After a few moments of utter silence, he turned to Helen. As soon as I'm through this door, you lock it up tight, he said, jingling the key ring. She nodded, and he turned to go, but she grabbed him and pulled him in for another kiss. Afterwards, she whispered, Be careful. I will, he answered, and silently slipped out the door. 6. As soon as Randy heard the lock engage behind him, he ducked low and quickly moved to cover behind one of the cashier stations. Now he needed a plan, and he needed it fast. Zima would be his bait, but what would he do with it? His mind worked furiously as his brain felt like a motor running on full bore. If he could make it to the back room, he could fill the yellow mop bucket with Zima and have a rolling bait station he could take anywhere. But what was bait without a trap? The store had a fair amount of insecticides, but it was all in aerosol cans, and there was no way Randy was getting close enough to that thing to try and give it a good spray. Then it hit him, making sure the coast was clear. He crept from behind the register and made for the aisle stocked with cleaning products. At the far end, he could see a stack of plastic mop buckets, and he slowly moved toward them. Taking the metal handles in one hand, he carefully tried separating the top two buckets from the stack, but found them stuck in place. He pulled a bit harder and felt the conglomeration give slightly, and then hold fast again. Letting out a long breath, he braced himself for a more forceful pull. The muscles in his arms and back tensed as he began another attempt to separate them when suddenly the vacuum holding them together broke and he was knocked off balance, stumbling backwards and falling against the shelf of laundry detergent. The buckets fell to the floor in a clatter of hollow thuds as Randy slipped from his feet and landed hard on the linoleum floor. Even before the commotion had subsided, buzzing filled Randy's ears and his heart leapt into his throat. His position had been given away, and he scrambled to his feet as quickly as he could. The scuttling of the mosquitoes' six enormous legs were drawing closer from the rear of the store, the side Randy happened to be nearest. Grabbing two buckets, Randy took off running toward the front of the store, away from the advancing arthropod horror. After a few yards, he looked back over his shoulder and saw that the thing was barreling toward him at a speed he knew was much faster than his own. Thinking fast, he tossed the buckets over the aisle to his left and began hurriedly scaling the shelves. As he clambered up the sturdy fixture, he hoped against hope that he was correct in the assumption that the mosquito had lost its ability to fly. He was up and over in no time, landing hard on his feet on the other side. The buzzing became more furious, but as he stood and watched for a moment, he did not see it emerge over the top after him. The creature's long legs began pawing at the shelves, and Randy could hear as it knocked items to the floor in its attempt to follow him. He didn't know how well it could climb, but by the sound of it, he assumed not well. The obstacle infuriated his pursuer, and the sound of violent thrashing told Randy he needed to get moving. Scooping up the buckets, he ran toward the back of the store and made a sharp right to the rear wall. The angry buzzing in his ears told him he hadn't bought himself much time with the maneuver, but he hoped it would be enough. Ducking behind an in-cap display of charcoal briquettes, he paused to get his bearings and saw he was exactly where he wanted to be. 
Next to the bags of charcoal were 32-ounce bottles of lighter fluid, and when Randy laid eyes on them, his lips curled in an unintentional smirk. In one large sweeping motion of his arm, he knocked the bottles into his two buckets and was about to take flight once again when he paused at something he'd noticed. A small display of spray-on mosquito pellet had been set up near the grilling supplies as a marketing tactic, and before he could fully analyze the merit of his action, he had removed the cap of two cans and began coating his body in the citronella-scented spray. He doubted the chemical cocktail would repel a beast with such a bloodlust, but maybe he could throw it off his trail for a greater or lesser time. Tossing the cans aside, he grabbed the buckets and listened. The buzzing of the mosquito's massive wings continued and grew louder at the front of the store, and he knew if it spotted him again, he could not repeat his trick from before with the buckets now heavy with lighter fluid. In a flash, Randy was pushing through the stockroom doors. He set down the buckets and quickly steadied the swinging doors, hoping to avoid attracting attention to his new location. Not knowing how much time he had before he was discovered, he bent all of his energy to his plan. He knelt down and began twisting the caps off the bottles of lighter fluid and emptying them into the buckets. The harsh smell filled his nostrils as he feverishly poured bottle after bottle into the plastic containers until they were both about three quarters of the way full. Quickly, but extremely carefully, Randy lifted the first bucket and carried it to the swinging double doors. Using his foot, he propped the right door open just enough to rest the bucket on top, bracing it against the wall above the doorway. He repeated this formula with the other bucket on the left door and stepped clear. They sat precariously above his head as if they were simply buckets of water waiting to fall upon whoever entered, dousing them in a harmless prank. Just then, Randy realized he'd forgotten a crucial element of his plan. An ignition source. His mind reeled at such a massive oversight and immediately began searching the back room for a lighter. Finding nothing, he toyed with the idea of braving the store once again when he remembered something he'd often overlooked. The store employed natural gas for heat in the winter and used an antiquated system badly in need of repair. So badly, in fact, that a box of matches was habitually kept in the manager's office to reignite the pilot light. In an instant, Randy was in the office rifling through the cluttered drawers, tossing paper and other debris in random directions. When his hands closed around the matchbox, he nearly jumped for joy before slipping it into his pocket. Back in the stockroom, Randy stopped to listen and realized that all was quiet once again. The repellent must have worked to throw it off his trail, and now it was undoubtedly scouring the store for him in the eerie calm. Taking position behind one of the stacks of Zima, he leaned against it and felt it pressing back against him. He shut his eyes and took a deep breath, tensing his body in preparation. Repositioning himself slightly, he counted down silently from three and then shoved the stacked glass bottles over in one great push. The tower fell over with a crash, followed by a hissing wave of clear fizzy liquid. Randy watched as the liquor spread and figured if the scent didn't track the thing, the commotion surely would. After a brief moment, the buzzing began anew, and it was way closer than Randy had anticipated. Before he even knew what was happening, the swinging doors flew open and the creature was drenched by the twin showers of lighter fluid. Its hideous wings continued to beat, casting off thousands of droplets of lighter fluid that coated every nearby surface. Randy tumbled backwards as flecks of fluid coated his face and stung his eyes. He rubbed at them frantically, trying to clear his vision, but everything around him was a wash of blurry colors and indistinct shapes. The mosquito's legs frantically worked beneath its heavy body, but could find no purchase as the conglomerated puddle beneath it spread in every direction, finally losing its footing entirely and connecting solidly with the floor. The furious insect thrashed its head wildly, its antenna swishing through the air like cruel lashing switches. Randy's eyes still refused to clear, and being unable to see what the creature was doing, he scrambled frantically backwards but halted when his head struck the roll-up delivery door. He stood and ran his hands along the surface, searching for the edge and then over the wall until he felt the release of the rear employee exit. As he spun around and squinted in the mosquito's direction, it looked like it was having difficulty regaining his footing, but showed signs of overcoming its predicament. Randy reached into his back pocket and retrieved the now crushed box of matches. With clumsy fingers, he removed one from the box and held the head against the striking surface. As the monster struggled to a standing position, Randy quickly drug it across the abrasive material and tossed it as the sulfurous head flared into life. The small wooden match struck the thing right behind the eyes and ignited the body instantly. A huge plume of black smoke rose from the flames, like a demon forced to vacate a possessed corporeal form. 
The flames spread quickly in every direction as they moved over the fluid cast off by the still beating wings. An acrid smell filled Randy's nostrils, causing tears to form in his slowly clearing eyes that flowed down his cheeks. The mosquito charged at him in a blind fury as its body snapped and popped, cooking under the dancing flames. Moving fast, Randy pushed through the back door and slammed it shut behind him just as the abomination collided with the other side. The door seemed likely to hold, but Randy braced it with his two outstretched arms as the thing savagely pounded on it from within. The sound of metal rending made him jump back as the proboscis burst through the door at him. It plunged blindly at him again and again through the sheet metal as its fury was slowly burned away by the flames. The grotesque tube retracted one last time, and Randy heard a thump as if a bag of flour were hitting a concrete floor. Shortly afterwards, a siren began blaring from inside the store, and he knew the fire alarm had been triggered. Soon, cloudy water began flowing from under the door as the sprinklers unleashed their payload upon the burning, awful heap. Exhausted, Randy collapsed in a mass of shaking limbs. He stared up at the blue sky and decided he'd just wait right there until the fire department arrived. Helen would be safe, if not a little wet, and he could deal with everything when it came time to. As he lay upon the asphalt of the loading bay, his mind wandered and he thought, maybe starting from scratch at the basket market wasn't such a bad idea after all. Fistful of Podcasts Radio.